Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tio Borkat Ashuk from Mechanical Aerospace and Nuclear Engineering Department. I'm uh, basically giving this talk on uh, behalf of my uh, PhD student, Yun Zhang, and master student, Wang Kai Zhu. They are both graduating in uh, spring, and uh, they cannot be here today. I'm going to switch gears from what we have been talking so far to the challenges related to accurate temperature measurement uh, using scanning thermal microscopy. So in order to um, understand what we are trying to do here, let's take a look at um, what is happening when we try to measure temperature um, using a scanning probe. And what you see here, you have um, basically that scanning probe here in contact and in here in uh, non-contact, uh, flying at a small distance uh, above the surface. Of course, one of the key things in order to do accurate scanning thermal microscopy is, first of all, we have to confine the majority of the heat transfer in this region uh, of the thermal contact, of the contact between the probe and the, and the sample. Now, assuming we do that, what is uh, then uh, the next step? The next step is, let's take a look at, uh, at this various heat transfer modes that exist at this contact. And we have, uh, we have uh, the solid-solid uh, interaction there. We have heat conduction through the solid asperities. And uh, the radius of those uh, asperities depend, depends on the force that is acting on the probe. And they can, uh, they can change, um, of course, with, uh, with that force and with location on the surface. Then we have, uh, in, the same, uh, in the same region, although we cannot see here very well, is the water meniscus. Because of the absorbed water uh, on the surfaces, a meniscus forms. And of course, the, f the radius of, his, of this meniscus may depend also on the uh, chemistry of the surface. Then finally, we have uh, other modes of heat transfer through the, uh, if, if we have, we are doing this in environment, uh, like an ambient condition, we will have heat conduction through the air. And uh, particularly in vacuum, in ultra high vacuum, thermal radiation across this gap may become also quite, uh, quite important heat transfer mechanism. So in order to do then um, accurate temperature sensing, uh, we realize that because of this temperature, uh, because of the heat transfer across this gap, which, which is a thermal resistor, there will be a temperature difference between the sensor and the true surface temperature. So in order to quantify uh, the heat transfer rate and thermal contact resistance, um, that in order to, to do accurate temperature sensing, we need to quantify very well this, uh, this heat transfer uh, mechanism. Now, when... Uh, for, 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 uh, for temperature sensing in contact mode, there have been uh, several, uh, several methods developed uh, in order to try to, uh, to, to control this heat transfer. And uh, for the purpose of time, I'm not going to go through, through the different uh, techniques that are currently employed uh, for trying to do accurate temperature sensing in contact mode. So I'd like to focus on what we are trying to uh, proof today is uh, we'd like to demonstrate a proof of concept of a scanning thermal microscopy technique that works under ambient conditions and is able to do accurate temperature sensing uh, um, um, and uh, in, uh, in non-contact mode. So what you will see uh, today is a validation of, uh, first of all, we developed an uh, accurate uh, three-dimensional finite element model for the entire probe and sample heat transfer. And uh, based on that model, uh, which is accurate, but uh, it's, uh, it's time consuming for data reduction, we are able to develop much simpler analytical models that are still able to provide accurate probe sample ambient thermal transfer characterization in non-contact mode, pending on getting two calibration parameters uh, from this calibration methodology that I'll describe. And then finally, you'll 
Well, uh, we'll see how this method works uh, when we uh, test it on a couple of several samples. For proof of concept, we have used uh, Wollaston probes, which are available in our, in our lab. We have actually a homemade, basically, scanning thermal microscopy setup. This is uh, the principle of the experiment. Okay, the scanning thermal microscope probe is actually uh, a thermistor based on a, on a wire. You will see an image of this uh, thermistor uh, in the uh, next slide. We have the basic uh, feedback uh, mechanism for controlling the surface to sample uh, the, uh, the surface to probe uh, di uh, distance. And then uh, we have here, you also see a reference probe, uh, which is basically monitoring variations in ambient uh, conditions. And the entire uh, system of the probe is basically, um, we detecting the temperature of the probe by detecting the change in electrical resistance of this probe. What you see here is the sample and the scanning of the sample. In order to, uh, to compare uh, the measurements of the probe, after data reduction with, uh, with our uh, heat transfer models, with uh, the true sample temperature, we have designed the sample where we can measure in the same time uh, the, the sample, uh, the average temperature of this, uh, of this microheater here. The probe sample distance uh, is going to range between 100 and 300 nanometers. 300 nanometers is a mode uh, where the heat transfer to the air starts to become classical, but most of our experiments are done in a non-classical heat transfer mode, in the ballistic heat transfer mode between the probe and the sample. Now let's take a look at uh, some of this. Uh, as you can see here, this is the, uh, the Wollaston probe, this is the entire probe, and this is a SEM image of the actual uh, tip, uh, tip that is using the measurements. Uh, this, uh, this is about 200 micron lens. The wire diameter is about five microns. And with this type of probe, we are going to do experiments on, uh, on micro heaters ranging uh, between 10 micron and 40 micron width. And these micro heaters are instrumented with uh, four probe, uh, you know, for electrical resistance uh, measurements. So we can basically measure very well the average temperature, uh, basically, of this microheater in this region. Um, the heaters are deposited on both uh, glass and uh, silicon, uh, uh, silicon dioxide uh, substrates. Um, I will talk a little bit about the three-dimensional finite element uh, modeling. Uh, it was done using the console uh, multi-physics software. Um, it's usually the console uh, works uh, by default with the classical uh, equation for heat transfer. We are able to, uh, to modify that. The console modeling applies for the entire probe, so we have about three orders of magnitude. The scales in this uh, in this experiment, if you look the gap here, 100 nanometer with about you know like you see 200 uh, micron long probe. But I uh, I would say that the key of this effort of this modeling effort that, that actually is the discriminant of the accuracy is basically how well we are looking we are characterizing the heat transfer modes in this area in non-contact mode, particularly for gaps which are uh, above the diffusion, uh, which are uh, basically uh, in the ballistic uh, regime, when basically gaps comparable with the mean free path of the, of the air molecules in this uh, area. So we are able to, uh, to basically uh, calculate this thermal resistance in this regime by uh, using uh, models for thermal conductivity in, a, in, a, in the transition, uh, transition regime for heat conduction. And uh, if you are interested in the details of how we do this, that's all coming into a, a, a paper that is uh, going to be published, and I'll be happy to give you more uh, details. But, uh, but this model, uh, let's see how good it is. All right, so what the dots, all the dots here are experimental data, okay? They are experimental data, and this, this, the, what you see here is overlapping experiments for three different, for di three different gaps. 100 nanometer, 150, and 200 nanometer. All of this, uh, all of this uh, gaps uh, for the average probe temperature rise, all of these, uh, sorry, experiments overlapping. 
So it looks like in this regime, a ballistic heat transfer regime, uh, well, it's, it's not depending on as much on the gap. Now this one here is done at the gap of 300 nanometer, and you notice that um, that basically clearly it's a bigger, it's a right, quite significant difference between experiments done uh, in the diffusive regime and uh, in this ballistic regime. Now the lines are the uh, predictions for the from the 3D FEM model. All uh, all predictions for the uh, uh, sub uh, you know for the uh, transition regime. This one's 100 nanometer. Sorry, uh, all of this uh, transition regime uh, predictions are also overlapping and matching very well with the experiment. Now, if we go uh, to uh, to use diffusion diffusion regime, uh, you know, thermal conductivities in our models. So, if we force the diffusion regime, like the the classical heat transfer, then this uh, uh, this simulation data will move. As you notice here, we have three different lines corresponding to the three different uh, gaps in the diffusion mode. So clearly, using the non-local, uh, classical, non-classical heat transfer help make this uh, a good, uh, a good uh, match between experiment and uh, theory. Of course, uh, for the diffusive regime, it matches also very well when we use diffusive uh, modeling, classical modeling for the 300 nanometer gap. So the take-home message is. The 3D FEM model is very good. It has no fitting parameter, an excellent agreement between the two uh, heat transfer modes uh, that, uh, that we have tested. Uh, but uh, like I said, doing this in real time takes, uh, takes a lot. Uh, so we, uh, we also developed uh, analytical models uh, for this uh, temperature sensing. This is the analytical model for the temperature sensing. You notice much simpler uh, equations. Uh, that, uh, that basically describe the heat transfer between the surface here at a certain temperature uh, into the probe and the fact that we are going to measure the average temperature of this probe. Uh, but they do depend, I should mention, on two criti critical parameters. This B is basically uh, the heat transfer radius in this region of the contact, and RTH is basically the thermal contact resistance of this region, and this has to be uh, calibrated. We also have um, um, tested the, our ana analytical model for a situation where we're heating up the probe and uh, with no sample uh, temperature distribution, like no heater on the sample, but with a heated probe, we also have uh, characterized uh, this uh, through analytical model in order to also extract the heat transfer radius and the thermal contact resistance from this type of experiment. Because we are interested to see if these parameters will be also quite good uh, if we do the calibration this way uh, in, in terms of temperature sensing later. Um, without going into uh, too uh, much details, I would say that um, we have also developed, uh, using the COMSOL uh, software, a, a correlation for this thermal contact resistance. And these correlations can be then easily used in our software. These correlations, there's one correlation here for the, ballistic, uh, for the ballistic heat transfer mode and another correlation here for 300 nanometer, which starts being in the diffusive, in the diffusive mode. Basically, um, the thermal contact resistance seen here in all these plots, the dots are from COMSOL modeling, and basically the lines uh, are basically disfitted. This, uh, this correlation. So they show that it's quite good. Uh, these are quite good correlations. They tend to follow pretty well the COMSOL modeling. Um, and uh, just if I con can point out here, you see here thermal contact resistance as a function of the gap. And you notice that COMSOL shows that quite constant gap independent thermal resistance uh, in this range up to about 100. Uh, 200 uh, nanometers, and then uh, the, 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 the gap thermal resistance starts increasing uh, significantly. Uh, these are uh, basically using the correlation, right? Using the correlation, which is this uh, shown here as equation 24, uh, we could get, of course, a curve for thermal contact resistance versus thermal exchange radius. And then using our analytical models uh, with the uh, either active or passive calibration samples. Passive calibration means 
We have a heater with the average known temperature. We scan that heater, and we, had, we, uh, we are uh, forcing our analytical model to predict the same temperature. Or active calibration, we don't have a heater on the surface, but we are heating up the probe, and we are then uh, forcing our analytical model to give us the same thermal resistance of the probe. So we are getting this, uh, this additional curve. Intersection of these curves with the uh, correlation provides us with the correct, uh, with, with basically the, the heat transfer radius and thermal contact resistances. And we notice that they are not the same from these different, different calibrations. They are not coming up to be the same. Nevertheless, we went and do uh, experiments. Uh, where we scan, we scan a bro uh, this is uh, what? This is 40 micron heaters on glass. Uh, this is uh, one is scanned in the passive, uh, one is scanned in the ballistic, the other in the, uh, I think this is, this is ballistic and this is, um, this is the uh, diffusive mode, different gaps. Um, what you see here, uh, the dots are basically experimental data reduced either with active calibration or passive calibration uh, constants. Uh, while the line here is actually the numerical results from 3D FEM. Okay, so this is for the uh, transition mode. And, and uh, they looks like the active calibration tends to come closer to the 3D FEM uh, results, but both of them are very uh, quite closed. Now, this is we move to a 10 micron heater. We notice again active calibration uh, parameters, very good matching with the uh, 3D FEM modeling, but, uh, but uh, some discrepancy here for uh, if we use the passive calibration parameters. Nevertheless, we found uh, we, uh, we also um, shown here measurements on uh, microheaters on silicon. Uh, for this, uh, this was a, a sample which have some unknown parameters. For instance, it was done on a thin film. So the, doing COMSOL simulations uh, we would have we would have to fit for the thermal conductivity of this film. Therefore, we have just used the passive calibration parameters, and uh, and when we compare with the average temperature, uh, average temperature of this uh, of these microheaters, which were done using the uh, four probe measurement, uh, we found only a three percent discrepancy between the average temperature measured with the probe and the average temperature measured with the thermistor. So. Um, like here is a, is an experimental temperature measurement accuracy uh, for different uh, samples uh, um, and different substrates. We notice that the uh, active, uh, the passive calibration, right? The passive calibration has at most about 3.5% uh, uncertain, 3.5% uh, discrepancy between the true and the measured uh, average temperatures in this uh, in the simulations. For the passive mode, sorry, for the active uh, active calibration, they they tend they tend to have much better they have to have much better um, um, accuracies unless we have an unknown sample. Like we didn't have all thermal properties well characterized for this sample, and if we use the calibration from the glass substrate, we we get large accuracy. Nevertheless, the uh, this calibration here. Uh, using the passive mode was much more robust. We found also why um, there were initially some uh, discrepancy between the uh, passive calibration uh, predictions and, uh, and, uh, and the 3D FEM simulations. When we did passive calibration, we, we have designed our heater to have uh, really one-dimensional thermal profiles, but you see here there are some edge effects. Therefore, the measured average temperature that, uh, that uh, we, we measured experimentally was actually smaller than the average temperature that we will get by, uh, by scanning at this, uh, this location where we did our calibration. After accounting for that, we actually have very good, uh, again, uh, accuracy actually is now comparable to the active, active mode. Okay. So we are with this, uh, this is basically the last slide. It shows that when we have heaters either close or far away, we are not losing that accuracy. This is only uh, pure uh, simulations of the measurements. And with that, thank you very much.
Thank you. Oh, oh, there's a question. Okay. Contacting console to share your results because they'd be interested to see how accurate the simulations are. Uh, well, we actually have uh, have actually uh, changed their the console uh, a little bit in order to get the accurate results because they don't have the non-classical modes of heat transfer. They would be they would be uh, accurate for classical, of course. Yeah, and I th I think they know that. 